Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disturbance. It affects over 3 million people in the United States alone. And importantly, it's associated with a nearly three to five-fold increased risk of stroke, a similar increased risk of congestive heart failure, and a near doubling in the risk of dementia. The mainstay of therapy in the treatment of atrial fibrillation is a blood thinner called warfarin. Unfortunately, despite the proven track record of warfarin, it's not suitable for every patient. Um, there are, however, emergent therapies that one could consider um, as an alternative to warfarin. Specifically, within the next one to two years, we expect new drug treatments that work as well as warfarin in reducing the risk of stroke, but have fewer of the side effects and the monitoring requirements that warfarin currently requires. For emerging therapies, there are really two. One, catheter ablations to treat atrial fibrillation, a procedure that's designed to target atrial fibrillation at its source and prevent atrial fibrillation from occurring, and a second to try to prevent strokes in atrial fibrillation specifically on left atrial occlusion or appendage occlusion devices, a device that's designed to seal off the region from which many blood clots arise. Another important treatment option to consider for patients with atrial fibrillation is a catheter ablation. During the ablation procedure, atrial fibrillation is targeted at its source, and these areas of electrical instability that give rise to atrial fibrillation are ablated or silenced. This is particularly important treatment option for patients who either have symptoms during atrial fibrillation or have failed other medical treatments. The patients at the greatest risk of developing atrial fibrillation are those with other heart conditions, such as high blood pressure, a weak heart muscle, or a leaky heart valve. However, in the last five years, we've learned more about the role of uh, genetics and atrial, in atrial fibrillation. Specifically, we've learned that having just one parent with atrial fibrillation has a near doubling in the risk of developing the disease. And over the last 10 years, at the Mass General Atrial Fibrillation Study, we've been studying younger patients with atrial fibrillation um, in the absence of any other heart disease. Um, and in those younger patients, they have a markedly increased risk of having someone in their family with atrial fibrillation. Also, with the help of those patients in the study, we have identified new genetic markers for atrial fibrillation. The first thing we're learning from those genetic markers is we're trying to under understand what are the underpinnings of the disease itself. But more importantly, we're trying to take this genetic information and translate it back into the patient arena. Specifically, can it help us determine for an individual patient what are the risk and response to treatments such as blood thinners or rhythm stabilizing drugs, catheter ablations, and specifically, does this genetic information help us figure out what are the outcomes for atrial fibrillation, how they might differ from person to person? Does this help us understand who's at a greater risk of having congestive heart failure, a stroke, or dying as a result of their atrial fibrillation? At the Mass General Heart Center, we have a specific program in atrial fibrillation where you can meet with a cardiac electrophysiologist or heart rhythm specialist to talk more about the treatment options for atrial fibrillation. We work in partnership with your community physician and can talk about all of the treatment options available, be they other alternative medical therapies, catheter ablations, and some of the research that we have ongoing at Mass General.